Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Patrick Brennan of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. His first time filling in on the Three Martini Lunch. Patrick, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Greg. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives as usual. And we start with the good and you know, evening hearings uh, up on Capitol Hill are relatively rare, but we got one last night due to a scheduling change. And the IRS Commissioner, John Koskinen, who testified before the Ways and Means Committee on Friday and got quite a grilling, uh, got a much deeper grilling on Monday night at the hands of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, to no one's surprise, the most memorable exchange happened between Koskinen and Trey Gowdy, the congressman from South Carolina, who is the chairman of the soon-to-be gaveled-in select committee on Benghazi. One of the issues that Koskinen has tried to state over and over again is that there's been no criminal misconduct by anyone at the IRS, as far as he can tell, since he got there, particularly in the handling of uh, documents requested by Congress many of which, of course, are now missing in this whole controversy over the missing hard drives and missing emails. So here's a couple of different excerpts on that front. You have already said multiple times today that there was no evidence that you found of any criminal wrongdoing. I want, to, I want you to tell me what criminal statutes you've evaluated. I have not looked at any. Well, then how can you possibly tell our fellow citizens that there's no criminal wrongdoing if you don't even know what statutes to look at? Because I've seen no evidence that anyone consciously... Well, how would you know what elements of the crime existed? You don't even know what statutes are at play. I'm going to ask you again. I think... What statutes have you evaluated? Uh... I think you can rely on common sense that nothing I have seen... Common sense, instead of the criminal code. It seems to me if you haven't done wrongdoing, it'd be pretty hard to argue that you've had some criminal violation if you didn't... Well, what did Lois Lerner mean when she said perhaps the FEC will save the day? I have no idea what... What did she say? What did she mean when she said we need a project, but we need to be careful that it doesn't appear to be per se political? You don't think that's a potential violation of 18242? I have no idea if it... Because you haven't looked at 18242, and you don't have any idea, Commissioner. You don't have any idea whether there's any criminal wrongdoing or not. And one other point that Koskinen then tried to make, Patrick, was that, well, I'm just saying that the White House never got involved with this because Congress has desperately tried to make a connection here between the president himself and whatever wrongdoing there was by whoever wrongly treated these conservative organizations applying for tax-exempt status. That didn't go over well either. It was Jay Carney who perpetuated the myth that it was two rogue agents in Ohio. It wasn't any of us. Was that accurate? Was that first initial line of defense that this is just two rogue agents in Ohio? Was that accurate, Commissioner? Uh, Not that I know of. All right, so that wasn't accurate, and that came from the White House. Who said there's not a smidgen of corruption? Who said that, Commissioner? Uh, My understanding is that was the president. It was the president. So that's Jay Carney and the president both inserting themselves into the IRS scandal. And you want to blame us for, for bringing the White House into it? I haven't blamed you at all. You just I did, Commissioner. You just did. Patrick, Trey Gowdy is where talking points go to die. Yeah, he's fantastic. To draw kind of a World Cup comparison, it's like watching, you know, like Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo on the field. It's just, you know, a lot of the other Republican congressmen aren't so aren't awesome in these hearings. But then you put Gowdy out there, and it's, it's just mesmerizing. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing five minutes. If you ever watched some of these old murder mystery shows like Real Life Crimes, he was a prosecutor back in South Carolina. And some of the shows, they have him kind of narrating how the case got put together. And uh, as far as I know, he never lost a case as a prosecutor there. And you can kind of see why a lot of these folks in Congress are lawyers. But for some reason, he's just got the prosecutor's ear and the mind to put misstatements and erroneous statements and the facts uh, all back in the witness's face. And the question now, of course, is whether or not this is going to get any further. I think he's certainly knocked John Koskinen down a peg, but as long as we're looking for stuff and as long as the efforts to say there's nothing to see here, look in the other direction, will we actually get anywhere, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I think that, right, knocking down Koskinen in a peg is is interesting, but ultimately he was not at the IRS during the, the period of wrongdoing. He was brought in as this kind of turnaround specialist. So, you know, he's not really to blame for most of these issues. The document production, I don't know. I think you need moments like this to keep the public's attention on the controversy. And so as the underlying document discovery goes on, you need to keep showing that the IRS isn't handling this properly. And Koskinen's done, uh, provided some pretty good evidence of that. Patrick, if you're a likely witness or likely Democrat on the select Benghazi committee? What are you thinking in reaction to that? 
<laughs> I'm I'm nervous because on the one hand, it's, I'm sure it's not easy to be the one witness sitting at that table in front of 20 congressmen. But on the other hand, it's actually a very difficult task for a lot of these congressmen. They have like five or six minutes for each of them to interrogate someone. So it's really hard to establish a line of questioning and get somewhere. And I think Trey Gowdy scored about three body blows in the five minutes, you know, which is amazing. So it's hard for a lot of them to do, but... Gowdy would be the guy you've got to worry about. Well, IRS is certainly one of the scandals that the administration has been dealing with for some time now. There's been kind of a whole domino uh, effect of of scandals lately between the VA and and Bo Bergdahl and now the ongoing situation in Iraq. But the VA was uh, one that was erupting right around Memorial Day of all times. And CNN uh, doing a lot of work. They're the ones that originally broke this story about the VA facility in Phoenix. They went back there for even more bad news. Here's CNN investigative reporter Drew Griffin. Pauline DeWinter, a scheduling clerk at the Phoenix VA, is coming forward because she believes she knows something that is frankly unthinkable. And that is saying something considering the shameful facts of what we already know happened at this VA. She says someone now is trying to hide the number of U.S. veterans who died here waiting for care. In seven cases so far, where she has determined a veteran on a waiting list was in fact deceased, she says someone above her has changed the record back. The veteran suddenly listed as alive. And we'll get to more horror stories in in just a second from Drew Griffin. But, Patrick, of course, the original scandal was that the VA requires that any vet who seeks an appointment gets one within 14 days. They were waiting months for it to happen, and so they were fudging those records. Now they're actually trying to make people believe that dead people are alive. So apparently the lesson on transparency hasn't been learned here. Yeah, it's horrific, and it's it's nice to see someone from uh, CNN displaying an appropriate level of outrage over it. And another whistleblower here. We had the doctor come forward the first time on that level of the scandal. Now this clerk basically coming through, as she was also saying in the story that she was the one who was determining after months and months of time, trying to prioritize people who would finally get care. And she ended up calling a different people, one in particular that she told the story of where the person had already died. And the family told her in, in great detail about how much he had suffered while waiting for that appointment. So some people look like they're trying to do the right thing here. And and literally people's requests for treatment are getting stuffed into a drawer. After that report where Griffin was talking to DeWinter, he came back for a bit of Q&A with uh, Anderson Cooper. It was on Anderson Cooper's program, and here's the latest shoe to drop in this scandal. This wasn't the only bad news coming out about the VA today. A scathing new independent report is exposing some of the worst horror stories yet. Yeah, the Office of Special Counsel, Anderson, this is a group of government prosecutors. They work for the government. They protect and investigate claims being made by whistleblowers like Pauline DeWinter. This agency released a letter today to the White House, which is really unreal. It details how the VA has ignored egregious examples of poor patients' care for veterans. In one case, a veteran kept in a mental facility for eight years before ever being evaluated by a psychiatrist. The Office of the Special Counsel says it's routine for the VA to ignore critical reports and also routine for the VA to not acknowledge that these delays in care, poor care, even abusive care, actually harm the veterans. That's beyond uh, incompetence and, and bureaucracy there, it, it would seem. So uh, do you think any lessons have been learned here? I don't know. It's it's The VA is, uh, as uh, NRS Yuval have input it, I mean, he said that the level of incompetence and the scandalous mismanagement there is just so bad you can't even imagine it and it's been that way it was been it was that way all the way through the bush administration it's that way now so it's hard to imagine how how they're going to fix it the it's just every level it's like the igs the the medical inspectors the the appointment uh the appointment takers and every level here is is corrupt and they're all responding to the to the wrong incentives but it's incentives that ultimately congress put in place hard to even put words on how these people are suffering after their service to our country and whether or not you can actually chip away at that bureaucracy and make meaningful changes to the efficiency of the system is uh, is, is a major question out there. Uh, and a lot of people, of course, trying to say that this is what we can all expect with Obamacare. Based on, on your reading of it, do you think that's an exaggeration or do you think that's got some backing to it? I think it's a little bit of an exaggeration because the VA is actually much worse than uh, anything Obamacare could bring us because it's a, it's a fully socialized single payer system. So Obamacare is extremely expensive and may lead us to something like the VA eventually, but it's not going to bring us there right away. Uh, The sad fact is that we're subjecting our veterans to something that 
was never even considered when it came to health care reform. So even the most, you know, with the exception of maybe Bernie Sanders, no one in Congress was proposing that health care reform should mean we move to a fully socialized system, and yet it's what we subject our vets to. So, All right, on to the crazy martini now. And after a, a bad martini that was that bad, we need something to uh, add a little levity to the situation. Yesterday in the crazy martini uh, with Eliana, we looked at Marion Barry going on the Daily Rundown, with Chuck Todd and stunning a lot of people by saying he never smoked crack, even though he's on that FBI surveillance footage from 1990 uh, that ultimately helped to put him behind bars for a while. Now he says well, prosecutors never proved there was actually crack in the pipe. He's never smoked crack. Simple as that. And now we've got another interesting Marion Barry story. I don't know if we've ever even talked about him on the Three Martini Lunch before, but he gets the <laughs> crazy martini two days in a row. This is courtesy of The Washington Times. D.C. Councilman Marion Barry ranted about a non-existent yogurt tax after he misheard a reporter's question on the so-called yoga tax on yoga classes and gym memberships. Quote, yogurt is really more healthy than some other things, as is cottage cheese, the Democrat said Friday night at a dinner in his honor. This is according to the city paper. I don't know who proposed that, Mr. Barry said. I think Jack Evans, the councilman, proposed that. I'm not sure, but whoever proposed it, it shouldn't be. Mr. Evans spokesman Tom Lipinski confirmed to the paper that his boss has not proposed a yogurt tax and doesn't plan to. You always see these uh, different reports about politicians when they get older, and perhaps in Marion Barry's case, he maybe shouldn't have been there ever. But when you start to kind of get a little rough around the edges, that's maybe a hint it's time to go. And not a, not a hint that many urban politicians are uh, are happy to uh, to take. I mean, I think the key point though is that as sort of a public policy matter, you know, maybe Barry had just confused the fact that if you're going to raise a tax on yoga classes, it's going to hit the same people that raising a significant yogurt tax might between froyo spots and you know Greek yogurt. So he may just be sort of thinking that. We're going to target the yuppies that are infecting uh, the District of Columbia and turning this place into a reasonable city. He wants them out. So either way, I think he may be uh, more sympathetic to the cause than he claims. <laughs> I just hope somebody interviews him again. He's uh, been great material for the Crazy Martini this week. We just need him to make three more crazy statements, and we'll devote the entire week to the guy. So, <laughs> Berry week. Sounds great. <laughs> right. Patrick, uh, great to have you with us. We'll talk to you later in the week. Thanks so much, Greg. Patrick Brennan of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And please join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.